Hi everyone, welcome back once again to my educational channel on biology. I'm teacher Janet and today we'll be discussing two subtopics from from 4 chapter 3. Okay? 3.2 passive transport versus active transport. So what are the differences between these two types of uh, movement of substances across the plasma membrane? Okay? So the earlier part of uh, 3.2 has been discussed in another video. Uh, this is the last or the, the later part of it. Then 3.3 uh, is a very short uh, subtopic, which is uh, entitled Passive and Active Transport in Organisms, uh, Okay, in the Living Organisms. So when we talk about passive transport, we can compare it uh, to an analogy. Okay, of a person riding a bicycle downhill. Huh? So when a person rides the bicycle downhill, he doesn't have to use energy at all because the bicycle will by itself move downhill due to the pull of gravity, right? So this can be compared to passive transport, which also does not involve the use of energy. Huh? That's why it's called passive. Huh? Passive means the person is uh, doesn't move around much, right? So in passive transport, energy is not required, right? And another comparison we can make with this person who is cycling downhill is that the person cycles from a uh, height, uh, the higher height to the lower height, okay? From the higher part of the hill to the lower part of the hill, right? Uh, so for active for passive transport. For passive transport, molecules move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. All right? And this process does not require energy for the movement. Okay? So remember, uh, when you think of passive transport, think of a person cycling downhill. Uh? Whereas for active transport, it's the opposite. It's like a person who is cycling uphill. All right? So if you have ever tried to cycle up uphill or climb up a mountain, uh, climb up a hill, you will know that it can be quite tiring, okay, because you have to work against the force of gravity. Uh, you have to move against the force of gravity, which is pulling you down. Uh. So a lot of energy is needed for you to cycle uphill or to climb up a steep hill, right? Uh, so likewise, active transport requires the use of energy for it to be carried out, okay? It's just a comparison. And secondly, when we cycle uphill, we are moving from an area of uh, that is at a lower level to an area that's at a higher level, uh, from low to high. So in active transport, molecules move from a, an area or region of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration, from low to high. Uh, so this is a good way of remembering what active transport is, Okay, like a person cycling uphill from low level from a low level to a higher level okay right so let's carry on and find out more about the differences between passive and active transport the learning standards for today's lesson are as follows 3.2 concept of movement of substances across a plasma membrane the learning outcome or standard is compare and contrast passive transport and active transport secondly for the next subtopic 3.3, movement of substances across a plasma membrane in living organisms. Firstly, we must be able to explain by using examples the process of passive transport in organisms. And secondly, explain by using examples the process of active transport in organisms. Here is an easy concept map to help us remember the movement of substances across the plasma membrane. So the movement of substances across the plasma membrane is divided into two basic types, which is passive transport and active transport. So number one, passive transport, it is the process whereby molecules move down the concentration gradient from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and it does not need energy for it to occur. Okay, whereas in active transport, molecules move against the concentration gradient, so it's the opposite way. Molecules move from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration, low to high. All right. 
and this needs energy. Okay, so for passive transport, it's divided into three types, right? Simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. In which facilitated diffusion needs the use of carrier proteins or channel proteins for it to occur. Then for active transport, there's only one type, huh? active transport, it uses carrier proteins, okay, and it needs energy to occur. So the acronym for the four types of movement of substances here is SOFA. S for simple diffusion, O for osmosis, F for facilitated diffusion, and A for active transport. Now let's quickly recap the four methods of movement of substances across the plasma membrane or the four types of movement of substances across the plasma membrane, which are simple diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. Okay, according to the acronym SOFA, S-O-S-O-F-A. So the first type of movement is called simple diffusion, which is the movement of molecules or ions from an area or region of higher concentration to a, an area or region of lower concentration, right? So for the cell, simple diffusion occurs through the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane, right? And what are the types of particles that can move through the phospholipid bilayer using simple diffusion? Now, these are lipid-soluble molecules such as fatty acids and glycerol, oxygen and carbon dioxide, and also other lipid-soluble molecules like vitamin A, D, E, and K, right? So all these can diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer by simple diffusion, right? Now, the second type of movement of substances is osmosis, right? So for osmosis, it's just the diffusion of water molecules or uh, molecules of a solvent uh, through the phospholipid bilayer. Again, from region of higher concentration to region of low concentration or down the concentration gradient. Okay, so water molecules diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer, right? So, thirdly, we have facilitated diffusion. The word facilitated means this type of diffusion needs the help of a channel protein or carrier protein, meaning the transport proteins, right? For the substance to move across the plasma membrane. So the first example is, uh, the first type is facilitated diffusion using channel protein, right? So here's a channel protein. It has a straight uh, tunnel or channel. Uh, that's how we recognize this channel protein, right? And then, uh, what type of substances move through the channel protein? Okay, uh, these are lipid insoluble substances such as ions, charged ions like calcium ions, chloride ions. Uh, diffuse, these substances diffuse across the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion using channel proteins. Okay, so these ions are small enough to move through the channel. However, for bigger molecules, they use uh, the carrier protein, okay, to move through into the cell, uh, to move through the plasma membrane. So, carrier protein can change shape. Uh, so, it's unlike the channel protein, which cannot change shape. So, the carrier protein will change shape to transport the molecule, large molecule, okay, from region of higher concentration maybe outside the cell, to region of lower concentration in the cell, right? So the molecules that can be transported by the carrier protein are large molecules such as amino acids and glucose that diffuse across the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion using carrier proteins. So simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion, all of these are forms of passive transport that do not require energy 
for them to occur because substances move down the concentration gradient from region of higher concentration to region of low concentration. Okay. However, there's one more type of transport which we call active transport where substances move the other way around uh, from region of lower concentration to region of higher concentration. Right? And this needs the use of energy provided by ATP. It also needs a carrier protein that will change shape when it receives energy from ATP. In order to transport the substance such as ions uh, okay, into the cell, as an example. So, an example of uh, active transport is the transport of potassium ions by the carrier protein into the cell, okay, with the use of energy from ATP, such as in the sodium-potassium pump, okay. And in the sodium-potassium pump, we also have the transport of sodium, you can also transport sodium ions out of the cell uh, from region of lower concentration of sodium ions in the cell to region of higher concentration of sodium ions outside the cell, the opposite way. Okay, so that is the sodium potassium pump, right? Uh, so this type of transport of substances, which is uh, active transport, requires energy because the substances are moved against their concentration gradient from region of lower concentration to region of higher concentration. All right? That needs energy. All right, let's look at this question, which is also a learning standard. Compare and contrast passive transport and active transport. Five marks. So this is an SPM question, and we have to know the similarities and differences, all right? And write it down for this question because compare and contrast here is a command word that means that we must give the similarities and the differences all right between these two processes so firstly at least have one similarity yeah? both processes occur in living organisms and both processes involve movement of substances through a semi permeable membrane in living organisms all right, because living organisms have the plasma membrane, right, that uh, is found on the external part of the cell, right? So that's where substances can move across, uh, either to go into the cell or to come out from the cell. So here we see uh, the structure of the plasma membrane with the protein molecules, all right? And here we see three types, two types of active, of passive transport, two types of passive transport, uh, using the pore protein, uh, carrier protein, and also one more way is if uh, substances move through the phospholipid bilayer, uh, from region of higher concentration, maybe outside here, to region of lower concentration in the cell. Here we see another type of transport, which is active transport, okay, which requires energy provided by ATP, and it also needs a carrier protein, all right, which can change shape to allow uh, ions or molecules to move into the cell or out of the cell, right? So we have studied these uh, processes of passive and active transport in the previous videos. So now let's look at the differences. Firstly, from the aspect of the concentration gradient. In passive transport, substances move down the concentration gradient or according to the concentration gradient. That means from region of higher concentration to region of lower concentration. Okay? Whereas uh, in active transport, substances move against the concentration gradient. That means they go the opposite way where uh, substances are moved from region or area of lower concentration to region of higher concentration, like cycling uphill, right? And it requires energy, okay? Whereas passive transport is like cycling downhill, where no energy is required, okay? As the bicycle will go downhill, uh, be pulled downhill due to the force of gravity. 
Now, passive transport. In passive transport, energy is not required at all. That's why it's called passive transport, right? A passive person sit down, sits down and doesn't move around much, so he doesn't use up energy. Now, in active transport, energy is required to carry out the process, all right? Because substances are moved against the concentration gradient, and this movement requires energy. Now, final outcome. In passive transport, the final outcome or the end result is that a dynamic equilibrium is achieved and then uh, the process of passive transport will just will not uh, be carried out anymore. I uh, will stop. So what we mean by a dynamic equilibrium is when the substances have the same concentration uh, in the two areas that were involved. Overall, they have the, the substances are at a uh, are distributed evenly in the system. Now, for active transport, there is an accumulation of molecules and ions on one side, uh, on one side of the plasma membrane, or disposal, meaning elimination of molecules. Okay, so either accumulation of molecules or ions in the cell, or disposal or elimination of ions and molecules out of the cell. Now, as for the carrier protein, for simple diffusion and osmosis, substances move through the phospholipid bilayer and they do not need a carrier protein uh, to, in order to carry out these two processes. But if we are talking about facilitated diffusion, which is also a type of passive transport, carrier protein or channel protein is needed. Okay, a protein molecule is needed to assist the movement of the substances either carrier protein or channel protein. Now, for active transport, it requires the use of a carrier protein that will transport the ions or particles into the cell or out of the cell. Uh, so it requires the carrier protein. And of course, it requires energy for the carrier protein to change shape. Right? Now, example. You can always give an example uh, for your table of differences. Okay? And in this case, we can say that one example of passive transport is the diffusion of oxygen from alveolus into blood capillaries, which we will study in a short while. Huh? And then for active transport, two examples of active transport are absorption of mineral ions by root hair cells. We'll discuss this in a short while. And also transport of potassium ions into animal cells using the sodium-potassium pump. Okay? So you can give either one uh, as an example. Now let's go on to topic 3.3, movement of substances across a plasma membrane in living organisms. Again, this can come out as an SPM question. So there are two types of transport, as we have said, uh, passive transport and active transport. So first, let's look at the examples of passive transport in living organisms. Now, passive transport does not require energy in organisms. Examples of passive transport in living organisms are number one, gaseous exchange between an alveolus and a blood capillary through simple diffusion. Okay, gaseous exchange occurs by simple diffusion in the lungs. Then number two, absorption of water by a plant root hair cell. Okay, and this is by osmosis. Alright, so it's a form of diffusion actually, uh, absorption of water. But for osmosis, it is the diffusion of solvents like water. Okay. Thirdly, reabsorption of water through the renal tubule in the kidney by osmosis. So this we will come to, we will talk about later in another topic. Okay. And then. Now, mostly, uh, if water is involved, the movement of water is involved, usually is by osmosis, uh, usually. So, the next one, absorption of fructose molecule in villus by facilitated diffusion. Okay, this is uh, not studied much, but we have to discuss this as an example of facilitated diffusion in living organisms. Uh, so, we'll discuss this afterwards. Now, for active transport in living organisms, it requires energy, and examples are 
Examples in living organisms are the absorption of mineral ions by a plant root hair cell. Secondly, absorption of glucose and amino acids in the villus. Uh, please take note that for absorption of glucose and amino acids, it requires energy and it is uh, it involves uh, active transport. Uh, whereas absorption of fructose okay, in the villus is by facilitated diffusion. Uh, for fructose is by facilitated diffusion. So for glucose and amino acids, the movement of the ions or the movement of these substances is by uh, active transport. Uh, it's different. But both occur in the villus of the small intestine. Okay, so next, another example of active transport is the reabsorption of glucose through the renal tubule in the kidney. Again, we will talk about that when we discuss it in another chapter. And lastly, transport of sucrose from leaf to phylum, phylum tissue. Okay, so let's pick out a few examples to discuss. We'll start with the gaseous exchange between an alveolus and a blood capillary through a simple diffusion. So the first example of passive transport in living organisms is gaseous exchange between the alveolus and blood capillary by simple diffusion. This process occurs in the lungs, right? So here we see an alveolus. So an alveolus is a tiny air sac in the lungs. And the lungs contain a lot of alveoli. Yeah? Alveoli is the plural form. So let's look at just one alveolus. Now the alveolus has a wall called, which is made up of uh, epithelial cells. Uh, that is one layer thick, right? One cell thick, uh, the wall. And then uh, on the surface of the alveolus, we have the blood capillaries, all right? to carry out the gaseous exchange, uh, gaseous exchange with the alveolus. So um, the alveolus has a layer of water or moisture on its inner surface so that the gases like oxygen, uh, gas that oxygen can dissolve in that layer of moisture or water before it diffuses into the uh, blood capillaries. Okay. Now let's look at the blood capillary. So the blood that flows in uh, from the pulmonary artery okay actually comes from the body tissues okay so this uh, this blood is deoxygenated blood because before this it has uh, this blood was in the body tissues and it had allowed this oxygen to diffuse into the body tissues for cellular respiration so now it has lower concentration of oxygen okay because the oxygen has been used for cellular respiration so the blood is deoxygenated blood and is denoted by the blue color here. Uh, uh, so this blood here has lower concentration of oxygen compared to the alveolus, which has higher concentration of oxygen. Thus, oxygen will diffuse from the alveolus, which has a high concentration of oxygen, into the blood capillaries by simple diffusion. Thus, the blood that flows back to the heart uh, via the pulmonary veins will be oxygenated blood. All right, once the oxygen has diffused from the alveolus into the blood, uh, so the blood becomes oxygenated, rich in oxygen, and it flows back to the via the pulmonary veins to the heart and from the heart to the body tissues. All right, so the, this blood will provide the oxygen to the body tissues again. Right. So here we write, uh, we can state that the oxygen molecules diffuse from alveolus into blood capillaries, okay, from alveolus into blood capillaries down the concentration gradient or according to the concentration gradient, okay, by simple diffusion. Now, how about carbon dioxide? So the direction of uh, diffusion of carbon dioxide is the opposite way compared to oxygen, okay? So the blood that comes in from the pulmonary artery, okay, into the blood capillary here, has a high concentration of carbon dioxide, okay, because this carbon dioxide uh, is actually from the body tissues that have carried out cellular respiration and produced carbon dioxide as a waste product, as a byproduct, okay, 
then the carbon dioxide diffused from the body tissues into this blood. Huh? So now it's transported to the lungs and it's going to be excreted. Okay, so how to explain the diffusion of carbon dioxide? So we say the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood huh, is higher than the concentration of carbon dioxide in the uh, in the alveolus. Thus, carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood capillaries into the alveolus by simple diffusion down the concentration gradient or according to the concentration gradient. Okay, so after that, the carbon dioxide will uh, be exhaled out or excreted uh, from the body into the atmosphere. So here are the notes to explain gaseous exchange between alveolus and blood capillaries by simple diffusion, right? So we start with the concentration of the gases. Now the concentration, or sometimes it's called partial pressure, but that will be studied in a later chapter, partial pressure. So we use the word concentration. The concentration of oxygen in the alveolus here is higher than that in the blood capillaries. So oxygen diffuses from the alveolus into the blood capillaries down the concentration gradient from region of higher from the area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration all right and this is by simple diffusion then another gas that we have to discuss is carbon dioxide okay so the diffusion of carbon dioxide is in the opposite direction uh, compared to oxygen so again start with the concentration the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood is higher than that in the alveolus. Thus, carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood capillaries, which has a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, into the alveolus, okay, according to the concentration gradient or down the concentration gradient. It's the same meaning. Huh? Right. And so here we can see the change huh, in the content of oxygen. Huh? Uh, the incoming blood will be deoxygenated blood but the blood that flows out of the lungs will be oxygenated blood. Okay. Number two, let's talk about another process of passive transport, which is osmosis. So an example of osmosis is the absorption of water into the root hair cells of a plant. Okay. So here we see a plant and Osmosis occurs at the roots here. Uh, so if we enlarge one part of the root, uh, we just enlarge one root hair cell. Okay, that's on the epidermis of the root, on the outer surface of the roots. Okay, so first we start off by talking about the concentration uh, of the water or the water potential. Now, soil solution uh, is where the roots are found, right? Okay. So the soil solution is the fluid uh, in the soil. And uh, soil solution, we can say, has a lower concentration of solutes than that in the cell. Why is that so? Because the cell sap of the plant has a higher concentration of solutes due to the active transport of mineral ions. Uh, constantly, there's active transport of mineral ions into the cell and then into the cell sap. Right? So... This will increase the concentration of the solutes or dissolved substances in the cell uh, or in the cell set. Now, if the cell set has a higher concentration of solutes or dissolved substances like mineral ions, uh, then what happened to the water potential or the so-called concentration of water? It will be lower because the concentration of water uh, has is different just the opposite of the concentration of solutes. Uh, if the, you have a high concentration of solutes, then you have low water concentration or low water potential. Okay. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, soil solution, it has a low concentration of solutes or dissolved substances, so it has high water potential, higher concentration of water. That means more dilute. Right? Uh, therefore, water will always diffuse uh, from region of higher water potential a higher water concentration to region of low water potential all right so it will diffuse by osmosis uh, water will diffuse by osmosis 
from soil water into the root hair cell. Okay, uh, that's how we explain osmosis involving the root hair cell, involving water and the diffusion, the diffusion of water into the root hair cell. Just follow one, two, and three. Huh? Here. Here are the notes for number two, the second example of a passive transport, which is the absorption of water into the root hair cells by osmosis. Right? So firstly, the soil solution has a higher water potential compared to the cell set of the root hair cell. Okay, the soil solution here has a higher water potential than that of the cell set of the root hair cell. Okay, uh, because as we said, the cell set of root hair cells has lower water potential because mineral ions are actively pumped by the root hair cells into the vacuum. Huh? So this causes a high concentration of mineral ions in the cell set. The ions are the solutes. Huh? So when there's a high concentration of solutes or ions, it will cause the water potential huh, to be the other way around, huh, to have to be at a low uh, level. Okay, so low water potential. Huh? That means the cell set is very concentrated with the mineral ions and it has low water potential. Thus, water will always diffuse huh, from the area of high water potential to the area of low water potential. Uh, so it will diffuse from the soil into the root hair cells by osmosis down the concentration gradient uh, from the area of high water potential to area of low water potential, high to low. Right. So no energy is required for this process to occur. Okay. So follow the steps one, two, three, on and the notes here. And this is the complete answer. Thirdly, let's discuss an example of facilitated diffusion. This is the absorption of fructose in the villus. Okay. So fructose is a monosaccharide like glucose. Uh, and uh, fructose is transported into the epithelial cells of villus by facilitated diffusion. Okay, so let's find out how fructose is transported across the plasma membrane into the epithelial cells of the villus. First of all, what is a villus? So if we look at the small intestine, if you cut through the small intestine and get a cross section, we will see that the surface of the small intestine has a lot of finger-like projections sticking out like this. To increase the total surface area of the small intestine for absorption of the digested food substances. Right? So let's look at one villus. Now, the wall of the villus, the outer wall here, is made up of a layer of epithelial cells. Okay? So these are the epithelial cells of the villus, not virus, huh? Villus, right? Virus means the microorganism, right? Not, uh, which can cause disease. So villus, the finger-like projections. Now let's look at one uh, epithelial cell of the villus. It looks like this. So this epithelial cell still has, you no, know, also has tiny projections to further increase the surface area, okay, of the uh, epithelial cell. Now, so let's say we look at one of these cells. Uh, let's say it's at the top here. Now the cell uh, is facing the lumen of the small intestine which is the canal eh, or the hole of the small intestine where there's a high concentration of fructose, right? Why is there a high concentration of fructose? Because this fructose is the end product of digestion of carbohydrates, one of the end products, right? So the concentration of fructose is higher in this intestinal lumen compared to, the, in, compared to inside the epithelial cells, right? Thus, fructose will diffuse huh, from the lumen into the epithelial cells, but with the help of a transport protein, okay, which helps move the fructose molecules across the plasma membrane into the epithelial cells down the concentration gradient, from the area of high concentration in the lumen to an area of lower concentration of fructose in the cell. So no energy or ATP is needed for this process to occur. All right.
So we've discussed some examples of passive transport in living organisms. Now let's go on to active transport. One common example of active transport is the absorption of mineral ions into root hair cells, right? Not water, absorption of mineral ions. Okay, so this is also an SPM past year question. Now how to explain the absorption of mineral ions into root hair cells by active transport, okay? So firstly, we can say that the soil solution has a lower concentration of mineral ions, such as calcium ions, nitric ions, magnesium ions. Huh? Just pick one. So soil solution is a lower concentration of mineral ions compared to the cell sap of the root hair cell. Okay? So the cell sap has already got a high concentration of mineral ions, but it still wants to uh, take in or it still wants to transport the mineral ions from the soil solution into the cell. Okay? So the mineral ions such as calcium ions, nitric ions, magnesium ions are absorbed into the root hair cells by active transport against the concentration gradient because the mineral ions have to be transported from a, an area of low concentration of mineral ions into the uh, cell which already has a high concentration of mineral ions from low to high okay from uh, area of low concentration to area of high concentration like going uphill as we said huh? all right as an energy uh, so this requires energy huh? this requires energy from the cell for the tra active transport of mineral ions okay into the root hair cell so just follow the sequence here, one, two, three, to explain the absorption of mineral ions uh, into the root hair cell by active transport. Lastly, let's answer one question from the formative practice 3.3 on page 64 of the textbook. Okay, so the first question, which is not stated here, I can refer to page 64 is uh, why do hawkers spray water on their fruits and vegetables? Why do hawkers spray water on their fruits and vegetables? So the reason why hawkers spray water on their fruits and vegetables is to prevent them from wilting, right? So these are the keywords, huh? the ones in red, which you must write in your answer scripts, right? To get the marks. Now, so other than that, we have to explain uh, what happens when we spray water on fruits and vegetables that are going to wilt, right? So water will diffuse into the vegetable and fruit cells by osmosis, right? Because the water is hypotonic. Huh? Water, the water is hypotonic to the cell set of the fruits and vegetable cells. So water diffuses into the vegetable and fruit cells via osmosis and this will cause the and the water will be stored in the vacuoles huh? so the vacuoles will expand then the cell cell in each vacuole pushes the cytoplasm and plasma membrane okay in the cell towards the cell wall so this will create a uh, pressure huh? which we call turgor pressure when the vacuole pushes against the cytoplasm and plasma membrane and then against the cell wall. So turgor pressure is created and this will cause the vegetable cells and fruit cells to become turgid again so the fruits and vegetables will look fresh, right? And then uh, they can sell more easily. Now, B, second question is explain what happens when sugar is sprinkled on strawberries. Explain what happens when sugar is sprinkled on strawberries. So the process that occurs when sugar is sprinkled on strawberries, four marks, uh, is that the sugar solution will dissolve uh, in some fluid and it will form a concentrated sugary fluid, okay? Which becomes a concentrated sugar solution, which becomes hypertonic compared to the cell set of the strawberry cells. Uh. So... That means uh, the sugar solution is more concentrated, right? Has a higher concentration of dissolved substances, which is the sugar. Huh? 
compared to the cell set of the strawberry cells. Uh, so water will always diffuse from the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution. So water will diffuse out of the strawberry cells, okay, from the cell set which is hypotonic uh, into the sugary solution, the sugar solution which is outside outside the, the cells which is uh, hypertonic. Uh, the sugary solution is hypertonic. So water diffuses out from the strawberry cells by osmosis. And when the cells lose water, the cells will become plasmolyzed. And the cytoplasm and vacuoles in the cells will shrink. Okay. So the strawberry tissues will lose support. And then the whole strawberry will become soft. Okay. So one tick, one mark each. And please take note of the keywords. Right. In the in the answer here okay now so here the cells become plasmolyzed so this is the keyword and uh, we can add the cytoplasm and vacuum string so this may be either one uh, either or uh, plasma plasmolyzed or cytoplasm and vacuum string uh, to get that one mark okay so take note of the words in red uh, which are some of the keywords all right so that's all for this lesson i hope that you have learned something from it Please share, like and subscribe and see you in the next video.